Welcome to Jesus City Online. My name is Jason Powell, and I'm the pastor of Jesus City Church here in Montgomery, Alabama. And I'm so glad that you're joining us for church today to hear one of our messages. Listen, our heart, our goal as a church is to push you closer to Jesus, that you would know God and you would make God known. I invite you to be a part of our church, to be a part of the family. You can just go to our website, go to jesuscitychurch.com, and you can find out about more resourcing and groups really some items to help you be more in love with the Lord, to help you feel encouraged in your relationship with God. But today, the message, I know that God's going to speak to you. I know that God's going to encourage you. And so I ask that you would just listen to it with a ready heart and hang in there. At the very end of our message, I've got some important things that I want you to know about, about the church and how you can be a part of what God is doing here at Jesus City got uh, a special guest with us this morning, and so uh, he's a good friend of mine, you know. So back in California, uh, you know, the Lord just allowed our paths to cross, and so Chad Williams, uh, just a close, close friend of mine, and I'm so blessed that he's able to join us this morning. He contacted me really late notice, and he's like, hey, I'm going to be in town. I'm going to drive up, and can I teach? And I'm like, let me pray about it. Uh, yes, <laughs> yes. And so, uh, you know, I just want to let you know, like he really loves the Lord and everything he shares with you. I mean, it's spot on. There's a lot there, but this is a guy that's just going to encourage you in your walk with the Lord, challenge you a little bit this morning. Um, but there's a little video I'm going to show you. It's going to give an introduction to him and then uh, we'll give him a warm Jesus City welcome when he comes up. So turn your attention to the screen. They say a single moment can change your life. Determined to be something more, he chose a mission, a mission which few choose, and even fewer succeed. His mission was to become a U.S. Navy SEAL, one of the most elite military fighting forces in the world. He knew the mission would push him physically, mentally, and emotionally, but nothing could prepare him for what would happen next. He watched his Navy SEAL mentor brutally killed and dragged through the streets of Fallujah just days before entering his official SEAL training. Training that is among the most difficult in the world. Through the memory of his friend and mentor, he not only survived, but thrived. Of the 173 trainees, he was one of 13 that earned the honor and responsibility of becoming a Navy SEAL. Wearing the Navy Trident, he proudly served the United States of America as a member of SEAL Teams 1 and 7 on numerous special operations across multiple deployments. He is a true embodiment of the SEAL Team motto, Earn your Trident every day. Former U.S. Navy SEAL, special news contributor on military affairs, and best-selling author of Seal of God. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Chad Williams. In the SEAL teams on the last deployment I was involved in, we were out in Iraq. And we were given the task of hunting down men that make suicide vests and roadside bombs like IEDs. And while we're out there, we're working with this group called the ISOF. That's the Iraqi Special Operations Forces. And so one of our goals with these guys is to simply teach them how to fight their own fights. And so we figured the best way to do that is not only train them on base, but actually go outside that wire and go fight side by side with them. Well, if you can imagine a whole deployment going by, I'd say pretty good because we've bagged and gagged some pretty bad dudes making the world a better place. And we're coming up on what looked like just enough time on the calendar to do maybe one more operation. We can squeeze one more in before we go. And at that point, we weren't really sure if the ice offers ready for us to go. Are they ready for us to be passing this baton of responsibility off to them? So we decided, hey, for this final operation, why don't we try and make it it's just a sort of graduation operation. We're gonna let them plan the whole thing from the ground up and we'll be there with them just in case things go bad. And so they're starting from scratch. They're hitting the streets. They're trying to get some intel. They find this source that informs them about this man. He's an Iraqi policeman, wears that uniform by day, but at night back home, as it turns out, 
He's one of these bomb makers that we're looking for. And to kind of give you an idea of the type of character that makes a suicide vest, oftentimes these guys that manufacture these things are not very motivated to actually be the one to put it on themselves. In fact, they have such a difficult time finding somebody to raise their hand and volunteer. This really captures how wicked they are. In one case, they couldn't find anybody. So what did they do? They resorted to finding two mentally handicapped women and they fashioned these vests onto them and they shoved them off to a crowded marketplace as these guys watch from a distance, setting it off with the remote, killing these women and obviously so many more. Just kind of gives you an idea of just how messed up these guys are. You know, but the ISOF, they've got this guy's number. They figured out where he lives. They're presenting to us this plan, how they want to approach the house, get in, grab the guy, extract, and it all checks out just like we trained them. Looks pretty good. And then they had one odd request. They said, hey, listen, we, the ISOF, we feel we get shot at more than you SEALs do. And we think we figured out why. And so we go, okay, have at it. What is it? And they say, it's the color of your uniforms. We're like, what? The color of our uniforms? Not the way we shoot, move, communicate? Nothing to do with tactics. You think it comes down to the mere color of a uniform and you can see on their faces, they're just convinced of this. And so the request, they said, would you be willing for this final operation to maybe take off your American colored uniforms and we got a pile of ISOF uniforms for you that you could put on? So like looking at these uniforms going, all right, let's get this straight. You want us to put on your uniforms in hopes that we blend in with you in hopes that we get shot at more with you. And they're like smiling. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, fine. It's not about the uniform. So we get the uniforms on and we're loading up the vehicles. I'm going off to the Humvee and, you know, my dark complexion, start growing a lot of facial hair, then get on an Iraqi special operation force uniform. I've got my, my platoon, my SEAL team looking at me kind of funny and they're laughing and pointing. I'm like, what's up? They're like, hey, Williams, you're starting to blend in with these guys around here. I'm like, kind of am. Uh, I'm standing up in the Humvee, that section called the tour. You see it in the movie sometimes, guy partially standing out of a vehicle. They have a weapon there in front of them. Well, the weapon in front of me on this night is called the 50 caliber machine gun. And for those of you that might not know, let's just say that's a weapon that could really reach out and touch somebody. I got my night vision goggles on. I'm looking through my green little world, just going over the mental part. I know where this guy lives, the plan, how we're going to get in, grab him, extract, and one unique thing I know about this operation that just makes it different than every other operation. I know this is it. This is the final operation. And then I can't help but to think about it. I know just a matter of days from now, I'm going to be back home, my hometown, surfing in the ocean. But here's what none of us really knew about that night was that we were actually being set up the entire time to get thrown into the absolute worst circumstances we've been in on this entire deployment. As we find ourselves being set up on an ambush, and as we're pulling up to this house, guys are leaving the vehicles, going out into open space, dangerous space. That's when everything broke loose. We start getting shot at from three different directions, taking effective fire, meaning the rounds are being effective. And now we're in this gun battle for our lives. And it truly was the team's ability to shoot, move, communicate that led to, I think, an obvious conclusion. I'm standing alive before you guys this morning on the platform. But I think it's also worth remembering and highlighting the fact that, you know, freedom is not free. And so we need to remember that our freedoms are paid for, you could say, in the currency of our soldiers' blood on the battlefield. And have you ever thought about it, that our eternal freedom, not free, and what was that paid for in? You could say the currency of the Savior's blood at the cross. And so more on how that ambush played out, if time allows, but what I would like to do is really paint this picture around this idea of freedom. This idea, in, in order for freedom to even be special, right? We have to understand that it's not just some built into life default position. There are those that want us in captivity. It's even the history of our nation. What is so great about being an American, there's certain things that come to the top of the list when you ask. People will say things like, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Freedom. Freedom's at the top. And why is that? Because it's not just some built into life thing. It's not the default position. And unfortunately, sometimes it takes a 9-11. It takes some type of an assault on our freedoms for us to really appreciate what it's all about. And so the very beginning of our nation was a group of people that had a desire to have liberty, to have freedom. 
You know, there was once upon a time a tyrannical ruler, a King George III, that looked on what was happening in America, and he didn't like what was going on, and so he wanted to impose things like taxation without representation, an uh, infamous Boston massacre, sending his soldiers to come and take away weapons. And then you have these brave patriots that stand in the gap and say, no more of this. We don't want to be under this captivity, this bondage, this rulership. And so they say, give me liberty or give me death. And unfortunately, all too often, that's what is took. It was through blood, sweat, tears, hard work, determination, but freedom did come. And it was penned into history as what? A declaration of independence. We are no longer going to be under this tyranny anymore. We want freedom. Well, that's the story that we see also in the book of Exodus. And I hope you'll see that that is a story that is taking place even to this day. And so Mark Twain, he says, history doesn't always repeat itself, but sometimes it rhymes. And you see this rhyme reverberating throughout history. What was going on for the children of Israel? They're under a tyrannical ruler, a king. And he wanted to put them in bondage, captivity, and slavery. But God used his patriot as it were, Moses, to do what? To stand in the gap and give a declaration of independence. It came in the form of, let my people go. We're not going to be a part of this anymore. And what I hope you all see is that what is going on today is there is a tyrannical ruler. It is the God of this age. It is spiritual. And he has everyone around the world in bondage, captivity, and slavery. And God has his patriots as it were, you and I, every card carrying Christian to do what? To give a declaration of independence. It is a let my people go message. Let them go from what? That bondage, captivity, slavery of sin? It's the gospel message. And so that is what we're all called to. And so there's some lessons to take away here in this book of Exodus as we look into the life of Moses as we see the one that commissioned Moses, he gave him his duty and his task. We're going to see the very one that commissioned him gives us our duty, our task, our calling as well. And so just to bring everyone up to speed of what's taking place, because we find ourselves in chapter three, what has taken place in the preceding chapters, we find ourselves in Egypt, and Egypt is the land of the Egyptians, but they didn't live there by themselves. They coexisted. And some of the people that they coexisted with, some of the strangers were the children of Israel. And everything was going good for a while. Why? Because of one of Israel's own, Joseph. Joseph, the ultimate rags to riches story. Talk about a guy that was not the victim of his circumstances. He knows what it's like to get brought up under the hands of domestic abuse. His brothers wanted to kill him. And then they realized they could turn a profit on him. And so they throw him into human trafficking. He becomes a slave. And then he gets wrongfully thrown into prison for something he didn't even do. But all the while, he wasn't shaking his fist up and saying, why God? He remained faithful to the Lord. And through that faithfulness, God would take him from being in prison and he would elevate him to becoming prince. From prison to prince, he becomes second in command over all of Egypt, second only next to the very Pharaoh himself. And so because of Joseph's rise to prestige, I guess you could say the children of Israel got to ride along on his coattails. And so everything was going great. They're flourishing for a little while. But everything has its season. And unfortunately, Joseph would eventually die. And we're informed that the king that knew Joseph, he passed away. And we get a new king in Exodus 1. It says, and he knew Joseph not. He did not walk in the footsteps of his predecessor, the Pharaoh before. In fact, they say he walked like an Egyptian. <laughs> Thought I'd try it out. I didn't even do that in first service. Right. I'll just cut out the stuff like that. Right. But <laughs> I got one other one I'm thinking about doing. I'm like, I don't know now. <laughs> All right, maybe I'll throw it in there. We'll see. Um, but he knew Joseph not, and he looked at the children of Israel. He saw how good they had it, and what was going on in his mind, a lot like a King George III before, like, hey, why don't they have it so good over there? Not on my watch. I should throw some taxation without representation on them. 
He's thinking, why did the children of Israel flourish in my land? And so he decided to make life difficult, give them backbreaking labor. But the more he turned up the heat on them, the more God multiplied, the more they flourished. So here comes the other one. In California, they took away the straws. I don't know, you can't go to a restaurant and get straw. But our governor was not the first one to take away straw. This Pharaoh took away the straw from the people. He wouldn't allow them to use it to make the bricks anymore. And so while he cranks up the pressure on them, they continue to flourish. He decides to go full on genocidal, right? He wants to wipe out all the Hebrew boys. All right, no more progeny. All the boys throw them into the river. Well, one would come to be born that we know as Moses. And that mama bear, she's being creative, her back up against the wall. She's protecting, hiding her son as long as she can. Then she realizes when she can't hide him anymore, I got to come up with a plan. And the plan was this. She observed how the Pharaoh's daughter would often go down to the Nile River to bathe. And she thought to herself, if I take my beautiful, precious baby boy and put him in a basket amongst those Nile reeds, her eyes will see, her heart strings will be tugged, and she'll perhaps take him in, do something. And that's exactly what happened. She saw heart strings tugged, sends her maidservants to go down. And ironically, Moses, as we know him, Moses did not receive that name Moses from his birth mother. He received that, that name from the Egyptian princess and the name has meaning because it means to be drawn out of. And so as he's drawn out of the muddy Nile River and he's being drawn into, he's royalty. He's getting to live the life of prestige. He's growing up in the palace. He's eating at the king's table and life is pretty good for Moses. But the people of Israel, they are continuing to suffer. And so Moses one day decides, because he has a heart towards his people, that he wants to take matters into his own hands. He wants to do something for his people. In fact, in the book of Acts, Stephen's testimony, speaking of Moses, he says that Moses thought that his people would understand that God was going to use him to deliver them. The way he went about it, though, was by murdering an Egyptian that was beating on one of his countrymen, and that was not God's way of going about it. And so he tried to cover up what he did, literally by covering the guy in the desert. Probably didn't take much more than a soft wind to expose what he had done. Another day goes by, a couple of his countrymen are in a dispute with one another. He thinks that his people are going to understand. God's going to use them. So he's stepping into play mediator, trying to get in the middle of it. And they look at him and they say, who do you think you are? He's like, I'm Batman. <laughs> they challenge his identity. Who do you think you are? Who made you judge in prince? And then they, what are you going to kill us if you killed that Egyptian? Could you just imagine what it would have been like to be in Moses' sandals at that moment? He risked it all. He had the life of prestige. He did not have to do what he did. He put it all on the line for his countrymen and essentially what he's getting back. And maybe you've been here before where you put your neck out for somebody. And the response is, well, I didn't ask you to do that for me. And that's what he's getting right there. We didn't ask you to do that for us. Word gets out that Moses killed the Egyptian. Pharaoh finds out. Pharaoh puts a hit out on Moses and he realizes I've got to go. So much for this life, fugitive now. He's on the run. 40 years later, this is where we find him and this is where we pick things up in Exodus chapter three. Exodus chapter three, just verse one for now. Reading from the New King James Version, it says, now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the back of the desert and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. Where is Moses? Way out there in the back of the desert. And what is he doing? Perhaps one of the most mundane, repetitious jobs, kicking rocks, falling around a flock. And could you imagine what it would be like to be out there and just going back in the rearview mirror of time in his head about how good he used to have it, how he was living like a royal. But look at me now, out here in the back of the desert. Why did I have to go and do that? Why did I risk it like that? And maybe you find yourself right now in that very place, feeling as though you are just way out in the back of the desert, 
going through hard times on hard ground, going in your mind, the rearview mirror of time, how good things used to be. Remember the, the good old days. But it's not like that now. Everything's unraveling, falling apart. The outlook is not very good. Well, let me suggest to you that maybe being in a desert wilderness experience is exactly where we need to be before God could take us and use us the way he wants to. There's an anonymous poem that I think captures this exactly. And it goes like this. It says that when God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when God wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all of his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world should be amazed, watch his methods and watch his ways. How he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects. How he hammers him and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay, which only God understands. While man's tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how God bends, but he never breaks when it's man's good that he undertakes. And how he uses whom he chooses and with every purpose fuses him by every act induces him to try his splendor out, God knows what he is about. And so while we're in the midst of it, lifting those hands, crying out, not understanding why, God, am I going through this? The person on your left and right, having no idea what's really going on underneath it all. We just have to remember that the master, the sculptor, he has an image in mind. And while we are going through this sort of chiseling process, he's got the hammer out, and he's chipping away, whole chunks are coming off sometimes, and it hurts, and we're like, why, ow? Just remember, when God's trying his splendor out, he knows what he is about, trust the process. And so Moses out here in the back of the desert, perhaps exactly where he needs to be, and there's biblical precedent for it as well. I mean, we know how this works out for Moses. We're, we could look back, be like, don't worry, Moses, it's all gonna work out. You're gonna get used by God very powerfully. But look at all the people of, of God. It seems as though these desert experiences are exactly what proceed. Uh, Elijah, he was a man in the desert. John the Baptist, a man of the wilderness. Moses, even Jesus. He lived a perfect life, holy, without blemish. And yet even he had his wilderness experience. And when did it happen? Exactly before his preaching ministry began. So being in a desert place sometimes is exactly where we need to be before God could take us where he wants to. Amen. Exodus chapter three, verse two. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. Then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight. Why the bush does not burn. Verse four, so when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, when did God call him? When the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God's like, oh, now I got your attention, Moses. Now you're gonna hear from me. Sometimes the suffering that we are going through operates in that way. C.S. Lewis says that God's voice is like a whisper to us in our pleasures. Hey, when everything's good in life, does God really have your attention? Hey, some out there, the way it ought to be, they're constantly thankful, <laughs> thankful. But others sometimes, it's like that saying, you know, there's no atheist in foxholes. Even the atheist in that moment of the trenches is like, all right, God, you got my attention. So Lewis, he makes this point that God's voice is like a whisper to us in our pleasures, but pain and suffering often operate as God's megaphone to rouse a deaf ear. Maybe God never could have gotten Moses' attention the way that he has it now, where he has him here. And when he was living that life of prestige in the palace, oh, his ears were all plugged. But he's got his attention out here now, and he is calling to him, and here comes the calling Jump ahead to verse nine. Verse nine, God speaking to Moses, he says, now therefore behold, 
The cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And he's getting the call. He's, God's basically saying, hey, Moses, remember that thing that you wanted to do? Remember how you thought that I was going to use you to deliver the children of Israel? Yeah, I am. You went about it the wrong way. You went about it at the wrong time, but now you're getting that call exactly what you wanted. Like Moses, I'm gonna use you to make Israel great again. And what was his response? Verse 11, but Moses says to God, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt. Man, what happened to him? How sad. Think about it. 40 years earlier, what was the last question that he was ever posed by his own countrymen? It was an, a, a challenge on his identity. Who do you think you are? And how many of you have heard that growing up? From family, from friends, from the world. Who do you think you are? and you allow that poison to get in, and it starts to transform you and change you. And so now Moses, where is that bold Moses? It's like now he's psychologically, emotionally beat down. He's like, who, who am I? He's like, dude, you're getting the call now. But he's been going over this same question as he's out there kicking rocks in the desert for 40 years. And really he's asking the wrong question because really it's not about who am I. The right question he will get around to is not who am I, it's who is my God, who is speaking to me. It is this way so that God will get all the glory in the end. We are nothing apart from him. This who am I mentality is very dangerous. And what we really need is just to have a heart like Moses had initially, a heart towards God's people, a thought of God could use me. That's the right heart. And even the world has recognized this to some degree. Like even in the SEAL teams, our SEAL creed, it doesn't say it's the uncommon man with uncommon desire. It doesn't say it's the extraordinary man that goes on to become a SEAL. Our SEAL creed says it's the common man with uncommon desire to succeed. Common man, uncommon desire. There's a certain perspective the world has on what it takes and what type of person it is that becomes a seal. You know, some people, they either got it or they don't. They're either born with it or they're not. Can't be trained. That couldn't be further from the truth. DNA will not determine your destiny. A good example of that would be the first day of training when I showed up. There was 173 of us there. An instructor came into the room. He's saying, how many of you are willing to die before you quit? Everyone's pounding their chest saying, "Who ya that's our yes. And he goes, great. Now this is what I want you to do. He tells us to start taking a mental picture of the person on your left and right, front, back. So I got these four guys in mind. And he goes, chances are by the law of averages, if you are still standing here for graduation day, each of these guys that you just took a little look at, they didn't make it. Do you really think you're the one? And we're all staring at each other. And I'm thinking, man, where are these quitters going to come from? <laughs> like, it ain't going to be me. But at the same time, these guys say the same thing I say, and they say it in the same way. In fact, we have already gone through some pre-seal training suffering under the hands of these instructors. They have beat us down, and nobody's quit yet. No one's even shown any sign of quitting. So then I began to think, oh, how deep into the abyss of suffering do we have to go before some of these guys start falling off? So realizing the majority of the room has got to go, I'm just looking around like, who could I pick off? Who doesn't belong? Who's the low-hanging fruit? And as I'm looking around the room, I'm struggling to pick anybody out. And then I lock in on one guy. The one guy I lock in on was this guy, Barth. When I looked at Barth, I didn't look at him in such a way to where I thought, there's one of the guys that's going to quit. I looked at him just like everybody else. There's one of the guys that will definitely be there for graduation day. Why? Because Barth was the stud of the class. He was the guy born and bred to be a Navy SEAL, blessed with some kind of DNA that produced the muscle, the stamina to wear. There's no debate over who's getting first place. When we're on the starting line for a run, the debate amongst the guys is like, who's grabbing second? 
because we know who's going to be in first. It's Barth. He's in a league of his own. So there's one of the guys that will be there for graduation day. He's born for this. And then I'm like, what am I doing? Don't pick the guys making it. And I can't pick any. And then how could I forget about this other guy, Alex Gagne? Total antithesis of Bart. This guy is in the very back on everything. He's the ugly duckling of the class. It's like an insult that he's even there. His story was a story of, he's like a video gamer, and he just decided one day he's going to roll off the couch, <laughs> unplug the electronics, and he wants to go be a SEAL. Does not look the part at all. It's an insult. Like, how did this guy get here amongst us? Somehow he made it through the bare minimum requirements, but he'll be the first to go. Like he's in the back getting all the extra unwanted special attention from the instructors. Not only will he quit, he'll be the first to go. He's the locker room talk. Well, the irony is that by the time we get to the most difficult part of training called Hell Week, where they keep you up for five and a half days, you get four hours of sleep. That's not per night. That's it for the next five and a half days. You're running over 200 miles during this time carrying a boat or a telephone log wherever you go with your crew. And then you're out there in the Pacific Ocean in February without a wetsuit on in the dark hours of the morning. It takes your breath away. It is so cold, we call it jackhammering cold because you look like you're hanging on to a jackhammer. Well, who's amongst the first to quit? Somehow Gagne is still there. <laughs> amongst the first to quit was that guy Barth, the stud of the class, the, the, the guy that everybody would have picked, the people's choice. And he was one of the guys that made it all the way through that pipeline and became a seal, that Alex Gagne, that runt of the litter, the locker room talk. What does that demonstrate? The truth of this principle about being a common man or common person with uncommon desire to, to succeed. And this is how God sees things. This is what I'm getting at. It's a biblical principle. You know, when they're looking for a replacement for the people's choice, Saul, that King Saul, they're looking around and He's going to the house of Jesse, the prophet. He's like, surely this is God's anointed. You know, the oldest. He looks the part. What was the response from God? If you're taking note, I'll read it to you. 1 Samuel 16, 7. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. He passed on him. Who do you want? He goes through all the sons. Is this it? Well, there's David out there, the runt of the litter, the locker room talk. You don't want him. Ah, check out his heart. What do we know about him? He has a heart after God's own heart. That's the one right there. God gets all the glory. And what does he do? He takes that little David, that runt of the litter, to take on even the giant Goliath and chop off his head. And so if it isn't clear enough yet, another Second Chronicles 16, 9, the eyes of the Lord go to and fro throughout the whole earth to do what? Show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are loyal towards him. And so Moses is saying, oh, who am I? And God's like, look, I know about your resume. I'm not worried about that. I know that you think that you were an influencer before. I know that you think I probably should have come to you sooner when you had power and prestige and you had a blue check mark next to your name. And now you feel all canceled. Now, now you feel like you're not the right person. Now, no, you're the perfect person. It's not about the appearance. Do I still have that heart? And it's there. And so he finally gets around to asking the right question. Not who am I? Who is my God? We read on Exodus chapter three, verse 12. God speaking to Moses. God assures him, this is where the power is gonna come from. It's from God. So God says, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. What is the way that God self-identified himself? It was I am. What is his name? I am. The great I am, still one of the most revered names for God in Judaism. We sing songs about the great I am to this day. And there's something important to understand about just how special this name for God is. If you recall the children of Israel at this stage, they didn't have a proper name for God. It was just 
forgotten. They would refer to God almost like in this third person sense. They would say, the God of our fathers. You know, he, we serve the God of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. How come they're not saying his name? It's a forgotten name. They're just referring to him that way. And so now Moses is asking for some special revelation. If they ask me, what shall I say? And so God decided to identify himself as tell them I am, has sent me to you. Interesting thing to dig into here now. And now we know how this plays out for Moses. Moses got the call. He's going to act upon that call. He's going to deliver what we could call a weaponized message. Let my people go. The power is not in Moses. It's in the one who sent him. And so it's a weaponized message. People were set free. And in a very similar way, like Moses, we get the call. And we get the call from the very one that called Moses from the I am. And he wants us to go out there into the world and deliver a weaponized message. It's not about who we are. The power is all in him, in the name of Jesus, in the gospel. And he will set captive people free. Interesting thing about this name though, is that during Jesus' day, the language of the day was Greek. We know that the Jews, they spoke Hebrew. They're the Hebrews, right? In the Old Testament, vast majority of it written in Hebrew. A little bit of Aramaic. That's their language. But in Jesus' day, Hebrew was practically a forgotten language. In fact, the forgetfulness of it started centuries before Jesus. And it became very serious. And so because of Alexander the Great and everything that he conquered, he conquered Greece, he adopted some of the Greek influences. One of the things he fell in love with was the Greek language. So Greek became the lingua franca. It was the language of the day. And so even long before Jesus, Hebrew is becoming a forgotten language. It became so dire that the Jews themselves realized we need to get our scriptures from Hebrew into the language of the day of the people. We need to get it into the Greek. And so they came up with a translation called the Septuagint. And it has meaning. It means the 70. They took 70 of their elite scholars and they surgically translated from Hebrew into Greek. Hebrew into Greek. And I guess you could say it has God's stamp of approval because the vast majority of the time you ever read your New Testament quoting something from the Old Testament, it's quoting it from the Septuagint version. And so what comes, becomes interesting then is, okay, so when God says, tell them I am has sent me to you, what, what is that in Greek? What would Jesus' people during his day understand God's name to be? When we sing about the great I am, like what would they call it? They would call the great Ago Ami. That's it in the Greek, Ago Ami. That is the name that is reserved for the God of Israel. That's God's name, the Ago Ami. You say it, you know exactly what you're talking about. Just take note of this and I'll read it to you. In John chapter eight. John chapter eight. Starting in verse 57, Jesus is in a little bit of a situation. The Jews are all about DNA. They're calling in pedigree. Oh, our father Abraham. You know, they care so much about that. And what they're doing is they're digging at Jesus because they're like, we know who our father is. Do you know who your father is? What they're trying to imply is he's illegitimate. We know Joseph isn't your father. And so they're digging at Jesus. They're going on about pedigree, thinking that that's what it's all about, as though DNA determines destiny, that they're just one of God's chosen because of a bloodline. And so as they're getting into it, Jesus says, yeah, Abraham, huh, oh, right? Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He was glad and saw it. And now they're all kind of laughing at each other like this guy's 5150. He says he has seen Abraham, verse 57. Then the Jews said to him, you are not yet 50 years old and you have seen Abraham? And so to them, they're thinking, this guy's out of his mind. And as much as we don't like him, we follow a law. And as much as we'd like to kill him, we don't have something that we could kill him on here. He's just crazy. And so there's only reasons why the Jews could enact capital punishment, right? It would be like if you're dealing with a murderer or a rapist. And so they, they got to get him on the rules. And so no rule break here. They just think he's crazy. Verse 58, Jesus said, most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, ago, ami. 
It is as though they're challenging him on his identity. Who are you? We know who our father is. Who are you? And he's just going into the scriptures, pulling up Exodus, the burning bush where God of Israel spoke to Moses. And he says, you all want to know who I am? And he pointed to Exodus 3.14. That's who I am. And it was not lost upon them that this Jesus in a bod just claimed to be God because their immediate response in verse 59, then they took up stones to throw at him. For what? Because they follow the law and they've got it now. Blasphemy. For you, as they say in John chapter 10, verses 32 through 33, for you being a man, make yourself to be God. They understood he claimed to be God. The issue was, is that they just didn't believe he was God. And so what we have to understand now is, now we see that that same God, the same I am that spoke to Moses, that commissioned Moses with the message, tell him, go let my people go. Now we know this Jesus, this son of God is the very one. And he speaks to you and I. And he says, I got a message for you that I want you to go forward with. Be my little patriot. Be my card-carrying Christian. It's a let my go people message. Let my people go message. And what is it? It's the gospel. That is the greatest weapon we have to do what? Charge the kingdom of darkness with, to overthrow the plans of the enemy of our soul. And so then you got to wonder, why are, we, why are we not doing it more? And sometimes we can feel as though, well, a lot aren't doing it. <laughs> so maybe it's okay not to. It's like, no, hold yourself accountable to the scriptures. Look at the book of Acts, this book of action, and see how Christians ought to be. And so we ought to be going out there and doing what? Fulfilling the great commission. I know in the military, if I'm commissioned to do something, if I'm told to go do it, it's a duty and a task, and I decide to derelict on my duty and maybe go AWOL, do I deserve to even be called a, a SEAL or a sailor anymore? No, you call someone like that a deserter, right? They're deserting. In a similar way, I hate to say it, but point out that we've been given a duty and a task, which is the very definition of a commission. We've been given the great commission. And 2 Timothy 2 says we are soldiers for Christ, we have our orders. Are we fulfilling them? There's a principle in scripture you see in Exodus chapter three, and it's a principle you even see played out in the secular world. It's called depraved indifference. You could be tried with a crime if you saw a crime taking place or you saw maybe a child drowning. And it's within your capacity to do something about it, to extend a hand and pull the child out. But instead, the person just sits there and watches and allows it to happen, the child dies, you could go to court and you could be tried and you could do some time. You're guilty of depraved indifference. In a similar way, consider the drowning world. If you take Jesus' words at face value, he says, why does the gate brought is the way that leads to destruction? There are many that go in by it. We are looking at a drowning world and maybe they don't realize they're drowning, but we're aware, we know they're drowning. And why are we not reaching out the hand at least? In Ezekiel chapter three, verse 17, is the principle there. He says to Ezekiel, he says, son of man, see, I've made you a watchman over the house of Israel. He says, when I give you a word to warn wicked people to flee from their wicked way, I give you the word, pass it, pass the word. And you don't do that? He says, they will die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. You're culpable. It's spiritual, depraved indifference. Penn Jillette, do you know that name? Famous Las Vegas magician, illusionist. He's been on TV a little bit. He was on that program, The Apprentice, with Donald Trump before Trump was president. And so you would, if you saw his face, you'd recognize the guy with the ponytail, kind of. Well, he's a very outspoken atheist as well. And he spends a lot of his time and energy effort speaking out against God and Christianity. But he made a very interesting video that went out online where he just had a little face-to-face -face with the camera and it's called Gift of a Bible. And what he does is he calls out Christians. You would think that atheists want you keep it to yourself, privatize it, keep it at home, don't bring it here. At least this guy, he sees, look, I don't believe what you guys believe, but if you believe it, kind of odd. You're not out there going out and sharing it. Kind of, uh, that doesn't comport right? 
And so in this video, I wrote down some of what he said. I transcribed it. He says, I've always said I don't respect people who don't proselytize. That means evangelize. There's a synonym. He doesn't respect people who don't evangelize. He's an atheist. I don't respect that at all. If you believe that there is a heaven and hell and people could be going to hell or not getting eternal life, and you think that it's not really worth telling them this because it would make it socially awkward, he questions. He says, how much do you have to hate somebody to not evangelize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it? And then he gives a practical example. He says, I mean, if I believe beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe that the truck was bearing down on you, there is a certain point where I will tackle you. And he says, and this is more important than that. The atheist is saying this, the gospel is more important than that. The atheist is saying, I don't believe what you believe, Christian. But man, if you believe that, how much do you have to hate somebody to believe it and not share that with people? Why are we so scared to share the gospel? Why are we not willing to do what so many Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons are out there doing for a lie? We can't do it for the truth. And so... Thank you, Penn. That's motivating. That fires me up. I want to share. And thank you because you just gave me a resource. Because when I feel like it might be difficult to share with somebody, I feel like this is a bomb ready to go off. I could diffuse it. How? I have used this. I just referred to it. Now you can too. Thank you, Penn. But hey, there's this very famous Las Vegas magician, illusionist. You might have heard him, maybe not, but they will agree to the truth of the words. In this video, this atheist says how much you have to hate somebody to believe everlasting life is possible and not tell them about it. Every time, hands down, without fail, the person across from me has always nodded their head and they go, yeah, boom. And because I don't hate you and because I love you, would you please allow me to share some things with you? it completely diffuses the potential emotional bomb that was about to go off, where they're about to be like, Christian's judgmental, you're on your pedestal, hypocrite. You know, no, you're letting them know the motive. I don't hate you, I love you. Would you please allow me to share some things with you? And so sharing this gospel message. And so we see how the enemy is always lurking about like a terrorist. He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We see how the tyrannical ruler, the Pharaoh, wanted to kill, steal, and destroy. How so many kings after. It does. It rhymes throughout history. And yet God has his patriots that stand in the gap, say, give me liberty, give me death, or give me death. Let my people go, or simply the gospel message. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis. We'll close in on. He says, enemy occupied territory. That is what this world is. But Christianity is the story about how our rightful king has landed you might say in disguise. And now he's calling us all to take part in his great campaign of sabotage. You wanna take part in a campaign of sabotage with divine justification? Yeah, where are we going? What are we doing? We're overthrowing the plans of the enemy of our soul. How? By spreading the gospel message. It's the greatest weapon we have to charge the kingdom of darkness with. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Thank you. God, thank you so much much for this gift of life, the air that we breathe, the opportunity to exist and to know you. And Lord, I just pray as we pray, we would all reflect on that, that we are here created by the creator for a purpose. And that for your people, you have already even prepared good works in advance. It's out there that we ought to walk in them. There is a way of life that we ought to be walking in. And when we get off on our own apart from you, we get crooked, Lord. And we just ask that, God, you would help set us straight. For those in the room that perhaps don't know you or for those in the room that have perhaps gone prodigal, Lord, that you would just prick their conscience, that you would help them to see where they have gone in error and that you would give them the strength to say, I'm just ready to let go of doing things my way, that my identity is not in I, it's not in me, it's in he. 
that they would turn from the way of the world, from darkness, and just fling themselves upon your mercy. That we could just be humble, Lord, and put our faith and trust in you, Jesus, who went up there on the cross to take all of our shame, all of our sin, all of our regret upon himself. You paid in full, conquered death, so that we could conquer death and live with you for those that would simply turn from darkness toward light. And so if you find yourself here this morning as we pray and you would like to commit your life to Christ, commit your life to God's campaign and his purpose for your life, count the cost, count what you're giving up, but at the same time, consider the cost if you don't give up that old way of life. And the reward, I'll tell you, is great. So Jesus says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father who is in heaven. If you would like to pledge that loyalty and allegiance to him now, it could happen simply through announcing that I turn from my sin and I declare Jesus as my savior, my Lord. He's my shot caller. He's my assault leader. He's the one that informs me how I ought to shoot, move and communicate through life. If that is you, this is a prayer where we say, I turn from sin and I put my faith and trust in the risen Savior. If you're ready to do that from a sincere heart, I just ask you repeat these words after me. Lord Jesus, I know I've sinned, but you died on the cross for me and rose again. I turn from my sin now and I turn to you as my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for dying for me and help me to follow you from this moment forward. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, love you guys. God bless you all. joining us today in Jesus City. I hope that message really encouraged you or challenged you in your relationship with the Lord to draw near to Him and to use your life for Him. Hey, would you go to our website? You'll find a lot more resourcing and things to encourage you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Just go to JesusCityChurch.com. It's there that you'll find out about events that are happening locally and small groups that are available to you. Other resourcing available online to, again, help you in your relationship with God. You'll even find a place where if the Lord leads you, you can financially support the work that's happening here in Montgomery, Alabama, or wherever you are watching. I want to ask one last favor that you would help get the word out, that you would like, follow, or share the message that you heard today. So we just want to say we love you, we thank you, and we are so blessed that you're part of the Jesus City family. God bless.